All righty. Hello, everyone. I see that um, some of you are joining in. We'll give them, we'll, we'll give others a couple of minutes before we get started. Thank you for being patient. Alrighty, we'll go ahead and um, get started. First off, I would like to just take a moment to um, share that we at ASSIS stand in solidarity with our Black uh, community members. And we want to share that we um, hope everyone is standing strong and um, that is given the wisdom that everyone needs during these difficult times. Um, please know that we at ASSIS are supporting and doing everything we can um, to be, um, to share some light on, on others and to uh, provide as much support however we can. So if you have any ideas, feel free to share those with those. We're happy to share any resources that you might find useful during these hard times or um, any action items that you have been using or doing um, that we could also share with our membership. But um, first, just, wanted to share that we do stand in solidarity um, and we're here for you however we can be. Um, I'll go ahead and start the event for today. So we have a great series of panels that are joining us today. Um, today our topic is how to get to director level and above. And so we'll be talking about um, sharing some tips for not only interviewing, but also how to make yourself more visible within your company and so on. And so um, uh, first off, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for being, um, sh being, being part of ASE. If you're new to ASE, um, welcome. I'm happy to share a little bit more about org our organization. And if you've been part of our previous weekly webinars, thank you again for joining us. Um, for those of you that are new, our mission at ASSE is to positively impact the American workplace by cultivating the pipeline of Latino talent and providing Latino professionals that insight, access, and support to be successful in their careers. Uh, we do this through a series of different events um, across the nation that varies all the way from high school to executive level. Some of our most uh, prominent programs would be our Mujeres de Acid Leadership Development Program, our Leadership Program for Emerging Leaders, University Leadership Network, our El Futuro Program for high school students, and a lot of networking opportunities that we have um, throughout the year in person, but now virtual given the, the current um, situation. So please stay connected. We're definitely trying to get with the times and offering a lot of resources on a weekly basis, not only webinars, but networking opportunities. Um, we just had a uh, recruiting career fair where we had over a thousand people registered. So we definitely know there's a need and we um, are working with our partners to offer those resources to you. So uh, one of the main programs that I want to 
uh, make reference to and, and make sure that you keep in mind is our 38th annual conference. This will be a virtual conference that we will have um, from August 27th to 28th. So please, um, it, it, it was supposed to be at the Radisson Blue, but now it's going to be virtual. Uh, we'll be offering a series of uh, mm -hmm. web or webinar training lessons, but also um, a career fair with over 30 partners that we have confirmed already. Nelson will be one of them. So you can look forward to seeing them there. Um, and then also, um, if any of you are currently in transition or looking for new job opportunities, we did want to share that we have a new career center uh, with job opportunities waiting for you. So we have many partners that are uploading their openings on a daily basis. You can also make an account and open your resumes and our partners will be able to identify uh, potential candidates on the back end. Um, so make sure that you do create an account and you upload your resume, your most updated resume, so that you have that visibility with our partners. And you can find that at jobs.aseonline.org. Um, and then um, another one of our events that we have on a weekly basis is our cafecito. This month we are doing a cafecito mundial where, where we're reaching out to our partners from across uh, overseas. Um, so this week we will have Josun Gonzalez. She is um, an ERG leader at AT&T in Mexico. So she will be offering some advice and we'll be talking a little bit about how we can engage with um, other ERG leaders from overseas. So that'll be on Wednesday, June 10th. Um, and then uh, for now, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll pass it over to Samantha Renovato. She is our um, star partner at Nelson. She's been great uh, helping us coordinate this, this panel and so, I'll hand it over to her so she can introduce yourself. You're in great hands and I hope that you take a lot of notes um, and that you follow up with us and share any feedback or any other webinars that you're interested in seeing, please let us know. We're here to serve you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. And we're very excited to be here with you guys today and sharing some insights and a lot of knowledge from our senior leaders today. Um, to start off, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Sam Renovato, and I've been at Nielsen for about almost eight years now, and I am part of the Talent Acquisition Organization. So I will give um, the panelists a quick minute to introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get started in our content for today. We will be covering three main things. So if you're like me and you're a structured note taker, these are the three things you can expect. We're gonna talk about first impressions, how to really uh, make your resume stand out, showing up, how to rock your interview once you get past that first stage. And then if you're looking to make a move internally, because there's more than one way to get to the direct director level, how to go about doing that. Um, so those are the three things we will be covering. I will um, pass it on to the panelists to introduce themselves um, right now, and then we'll get started with some awesome questions. This is Melissa Thompson. I am the head of talent acquisition for the media side of our business. And I've been with Nielsen for just at four months. And prior to Nielsen, I was at McGraw-Hill, and prior to that, at Citrix. Hello, everybody. Miriam. I'm Mir Miriam Villadon. Uh, I'm the VP of Diversity and Inclusion for Nielsen. I lead our um, employee, uh, global employee resource groups. And I've been with Nielsen for 17 years. It seems crazy, but it's the truth. 17 years. I... Um, I'm originally Peruvian, and I work at a for a Tampa office in Florida. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Guevara, originally from Venezuela in Nielsen since 2006. So that means uh, like uh, almost 14 years. It was June 20, uh, 2006. Um, I have been in Nielsen in different roles, different countries, uh, different regions. Uh, I have been in Latin America, in Europe, uh, touching a little bit of Asia and now in US for the last seven years. So um, my role is I'm responsible for everything that is coming to Nielsen in terms of data, uh, what we call input operations, data collection, digital and manually done. And we have operations across 97 countries where we have collection 
processes in place. So that's, that's me. Awesome, thank you. So in terms of getting your foot in the door, the first step is kind of figuring out how do you make your resume stand out? Um, so what do you look for? And, and I'll start with, with you, Jose Luis, from like a business perspective. Um, what do you look for in a resume for someone at that director level and above? Thank you, Sam. And um, uh, I, you know, there is a long list. It can be a long list of things that you see right in, in a resume. And we always try to make as much as we can in one one page kind of summary. But I would, I would emphasize in two things, right? Very critical, especially at this level. One is impact. Right? And, you know, what is the impact that you have had in each role, previous role, before going into this new opportunity? And what I mean about impact is, um, um, and, and let me go to the second comment, right? It's the impact, but it have to be based and supported with facts, you know? And when you talk about impact is, in my previous role, I was able to, you know, transform the organization, delivering these type of efficiencies, bringing this type of revenue, right? I double sales in, uh, in, in this period of time, you know, make it a smart, right? Make it, make it a specific, but emphasize on the impact. That is one thing that I always look when I, I everywhere I go, and I'm, I'm talking about globally, right? So uh, I look for the impact of the person in that role. Very important, right? And uh, because at the end of the day, this is uh, at this level is where, uh, you know, the relevance of the, of the leader is, uh, is becoming uh, important. The second one is um, what is the decision making process and uh, that happened that happened in that role and uh, that is described briefly, delivering that, in, that, that impact. It's not only about the impact, but also what are the key elements that make that possible to deliver that impact. So for me, these are two things, very important one that you should keep in mind, you know, preparing a, a, a resume. Awesome, thank you. Um, and in terms of having an online presence, we know that uh, most of us do have a LinkedIn profile and that can a lot of times be a reflection of that, that resume um, as well. So how important is actually having that online presence in order to get noticed? Um, from my perspective, your LinkedIn profile is your always on advertisement for who you are and what you do. So in a bit of alignment with what Jose Luis said, does your LinkedIn profile talk about what you've accomplished? Does it talk about metrics? Because hiring managers and recruiters are more than likely going to look at your profile on LinkedIn before they have any conversation with you. So if your LinkedIn profile shows um, your title and nothing else, you may lose out to the person who's taken the time to add some additional information. I would just, my caution is, it's not meant to be war and peace, right? It's meant to be a really uh, concise overview of the things you've accomplished, accomplished in the roles you've been in. That's great. Thank you. And how do you um, also network effectively to get to even applying for a role or getting into the interview? I think that's a very important question, Sam, um, because many people manage their careers by focusing on what they need to deliver today. And I understand that because we are all super busy. But if you think about your career, as you think about your work, when you're working, you, create, you devise a plan, right? You create a project plan, you have stakeholders, you identify who do I need to know, who do I need to influence, and that's really how you get your work done, how you can achieve outcomes. And you have to think about your career in the same manner, right? You have to think of, of your career as a project that you're leading and that you're driving and that there are people you need to know and people you need to influence. So when I think of networking, I think about it in two ways. One is who do I need to know and influence because in the long term, I wanna learn from them. And I know that potentially they can learn from me. So I'm always looking at who are those key individuals that can really not, not, don't think about it as they can give me my next job. No, those individuals that I can learn from, that I can get insights from, and that potentially I can mm. give them my perspective. And then on the other hand, I always think of not only staying 
you know, in my day to day, but opening up my, you know, my life or my work to learning from other people. And I think in companies like Nielsen, we have an advantage of having employee resource groups, of having forums that really help us meet people that otherwise you wouldn't meet because they're not part of your circle. So, you know, since 2000, I would say seven, when I joined the first ERG, uh, I've been really been deliberate to invest time in getting to know others, not to get a promotion, not to ask for a job, to get to know other people, to understand where they're coming from, to see how I can help them, you know, what I can offer to their lives. And I think that that's the most efficient way to network and get to know other people that can help you, right, beyond, beyond your day-to-day -day job. Yeah. And it's important in, in building those relationships too, um, that once you do have that trusting relationship, a lot of times it could lead to a, uh, to a job opportunity. So I think while it's not something that you're looking for directly when you're networking with someone, a lot of times it can be kind of like a, a side effect or something that comes um, later. So, so with that in mind, how do you um, become a top of mind candidate for a role that's not even posted, right? Because a lot of times we think that networking can help with that. Um, so uh, Melissa, from a, a TA leadership perspective, how does that happen or, and how does that come to be? One of the things you have to think about is quite often when promotions are going to be discussed, you're not going to be in the room. So how can you make sure that in executives in your company that are going to be able to influence promotions know who you are and what you've done and what your promotions are. So I know that in our current environment, it's hard to run into somebody in the elevator, but it is possible to think about within your organization, how can you make sure that there's awareness of what you've accomplished, what you can do, and what you want to do? Uh, so Sam, and, Melissa. Uh, Go ahead, Jose. I just want to say because I'm making connection on everything that we have said here, right? We were talking about, you know, showing impact, you know, making sure that that is visible and understandable, yeah. right? Second is advertising, being, uh, you know, open and sharing and, and, and being active on that, having a leading role on that promotion of your career. The third is, you know, making sure that not only via technology, but also face to face and personally. You can influence, you can share that one, which is networking. If you think about everything that we are talking inside, it's all interconnected, right? It's not, not things that are going to work, but, oh, I'm just going to go and do one. Everything, Sam, and, and uh, you know, uh, the way that I see this, this is a system, right? Mm -hmm. Everything has to be balanced, have to be connected, and have to happen in order to make that um, um, uh, aspiration real. That's, uh, that's what I yeah. want to share here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I was going to add to that, um, you know, it, I agree 100%. And one thing that might seem simple, but it's not, is know what you want. And I don't mean necessarily I want this job tomorrow, right? Because I have seen situations where people say, oh, I want to be the VP of this. And perhaps you're not even working on that side. You, you don't have the experiences. Think about it from what do you want to do? I can tell you from my experience and from my personal situation, I know that I like to solve problems. I know that I like to engage and I like to build new things. And I open, you know, my, my desires and what I enjoy doing. And I speak with them, uh, with people about them. I speak, I tell them, this is what I would love. This is what I would want. So I'm trying to track potential opportunities and then I go and I, I tell people I make them known and I think by doing that you also can now become top of mind many people don't know what they want or you know perhaps they haven't voiced it because of fear of well if I voice it then I'm going to become a threat to somebody else or if I voice it why would they give it to me but I think that if you truly want to be top of mind you have to be very open to what you want and not necessarily in terms of you just one job title in terms of what you enjoy and what you're good at. Yeah. And, and that's great too, Miriam. And um, I think I'm just gonna throw in here maybe a little bit of like myth busting too, right? Because a lot of times in the like Latino community, I have heard, so that's why I'm myth busting it right now that, you know, 
sometimes you don't want to talk about uh, your ambitions or what you want to do next because you know you might have uh, you know to your point Miriam you might be threatening someone or you might have like a, el mal de ojo and all of these other things that you know some people believe but I, I feel like it's absolutely necessary that you do have to uh, vocalize and people have to know what it is that you want to achieve uh, so that they can help you get there. And it's totally okay to, to get some help uh, for you to get there too. Um, you have to be your own best advocate, Sam. You have to be willing to um, speak up and speak out around who you are, who you want to be, what your personal brand is, what your passion is, because those are the things that people are going to remember when they're having those conversations behind the closed doors. Yeah. Um, there was a question that came in that asked about outside of LinkedIn, what other things could you consider? Um, first, I would say um, all of your social profiles are connected to you. So don't think that if you're doing something on Instagram that it will never be noticed by someone who might be considering interviewing you. So you should think about all of the platforms that you use and how that reflects who you are and who you want to be. Um, but secondarily, I, I think there are opportunities for you to um, do your own personal blog, tell your own story. And when you have those things out there, if someone Googles you and the first thing that comes up is an article that you wrote about this thing that you're passionate about, it tells a story before you even get to have the interview conversation. So um, I think everyone has to decide what platforms work best for them, uh, but then also just be aware that those platforms are public, no matter how much you may have used, you know, the, the privacy keys. Yep. Great advice, especially now that we're seeing how much um, those social media platforms can impact um, even having employment or keeping your job um, in today's current environment as well. Um, we do, we are having some questions come in. So I, I do wanna let you all know, please keep them coming. I will address them towards the end. Um, so thank you for, for starting to think of those. I really appreciate it. Um, so in terms of getting, you've made it past the first stage and now you're, you're actually in the interview Then you're excited. So what are some uh, unique things that you look for to identify uh, leaders in your interview process? Um, let me start. Yeah, okay, let me, let, me, let me start saying, you know, um, first, I'm, I love to see vision, right? And I will connect that to the previous topic in terms of, you know, being vocal on what I want myself to be here. What is going to be my contribution? What is going to be my impact, right? That means that you already built a vision of yourself in that role. I, I, this is something that I want to get it very quick. Right, when I interview somebody uh, and, uh, and also, and it will be even, that would be my suggestion, being even more aggressive. What is your vision of the organization? How you are gonna take that organization moving forward? If you go that step, might probably be not aligned, fully aligned to who is interviewing you, but that means that you really went deep into defining you, making connection you with the role and and painting a vision of yourself there and the organization. For me, this is a super powerful message from any, inter, um, any candidate because that means that, you know, the interest, there is interest, there is passion, there is, um, you know, a rational thinking behind. This is not just to come and, and sit and have an interview. So that, I, that would be for me one extremely important. I have a bunch of other things, right? But uh, this one, I will uh, let the others to, to share theirs. Very important. I would say that one thing that I have always asked, um, no matter how long I've been doing interviewing, is uh, a very simple question, which is, tell me about a difficult problem that you've had to solve. And the reason I ask that question is, I want to know if what you think difficult is matches what I'm going to expect you to be able to solve in this role. But secondarily, I want to know if you're actually going to come with a complete solution. Um, did you engage other people in solving your problem? Did you do research in solving your problem? 
Did you just do it all by yourself? And if so, what does that mean about how you might work with a team? So it's a really simple question, but I use it as an overlay to help me think about um, how broad this Okay, I think we might have lost a little bit of audio towards the end there, Melissa. Um, let's see if we can um, get that back up. Um, but that was um, a great way to assess the, to make sure that your level of difficulty and what you think is difficult and they should be able to do uh, matches your expectations. It's almost expectations um, starting from the beginning, which I think is great. Um, Miriam, I, I don't think I've heard from you. What are your thoughts around this question? You know, I completely agree with Melissa. I should say that my background is in BPI, so I'm a black belt. And I can tell you that, you know, from my background, you learn to create a, a framework of problem solving. So it doesn't matter if you're as, as an expert as me or not, you have that framework on how do you solve problems. You know, and I think that that's very important for leaders, not necessarily the need to be black belts, but do you have a framework that you use on how you solve issues? So even if, if you don't know what's coming ahead, let's be honest, we're living in a world that, you know, we're seeing changes in, the, in technology, changes in how organizations operate, but also we're seeing a lot of things outside in the world, social injustice, racial injustice, we're seeing things that are impacting our organizations and our people. So you're not gonna have all the answers. And I, we need leaders that are able to be agile and that they have a right framework to solve problems. And secondly, people who are socially conscious, leaders who care about others and who are willing to put people at the center to grow and to um, take the organization to the next level. And to me, those two things are, are vital in today's world. Yep, absolutely. Um, there is um, going with the, the interview process and kind of how do you get like that experience of like having difficult problems to solve or, you know, projects where, where you're leading and solving those, um, those type of uh, problems. Um, how do you, a lot of times people think that you need to have an executive sponsor or a mentor to help lead uh, or to help coach you get to those projects and actually get to leading those projects. So if I don't have an executive sponsor or a mentor, like how do I get one? How do I get noticed? Um, yeah, so I, I think I can, I can answer that. It's interesting. I think that for diverse communities, having a sponsor and a mentor is very, very important. Um, so let's first speak about mentors. So I, I, I think, you know, I've been asked to be mentor uh, of people and I never turn down someone, I'm going to be honest. So I think that if you ask someone who has the skill sets that you need to develop or the experiences that you need to develop in that moment, I think you should go and ask the person directly. But know that mentorship doesn't mean that I can give you a job tomorrow, right? Because that's also the confusion where people are seeking mentorship. They're not seeking mentorship. What they're seeking is sponsorship. And that's different. I'll address that. But for mentorship, I think you need to be clear on what skills and experiences you need to develop. And you need to walk up to the person and say, I really want you to be my mentor. I need 30 minutes of your time. I won't waste it, I promise. 30 minutes of your time once a month and this is what I want you to mentor me on. Two things, two experiences that I really want to grow and develop. You know, if somebody turns you down, honestly, that was not the right mentor. Then you try the next one. <laughs> yeah, Miriam, Miriam you, you were talking before about how important it is to lead, right? Uh, you, yourself, your career. This is one, that's another step in leading your career and managing your career, right? Don't wait for any organization to find a mentor to you. You can have a mentor outside even, a, you know, that is not even in the company. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I can tell you how useful it is to have somebody that is, you know, available for you. And I agree with you, Miriam. It's very hard to say no, right? Because you, when, when this authentic approach to get a, a, a mentorship and help from somebody that has been, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, facing some challenges or, or even with different experience. I have a mentor that he was not even close to my work and, and my operation. 
but it was fantastic opening my eyes in many aspects, especially managing people, by the way, right? That was years ago. You know, when I was, I was approaching and using uh, techniques and, uh, and tools that I thought they were going to be impactful managing people and they, I, didn't, I didn't see them. This mentor, no close to operations, no close to my business, was able to ask a few questions and, and show me that I, I probably was not really understanding you know, the approach and, and, and the gaps. Um, but don't wait. Take, take the leading role in that process, right? And, and, and look for, for those mentors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that sponsorship sometimes can evolve out of a mentor, right? Could, but sponsorship is something that go, grows a little bit organically, right? So you display certain behaviors and somebody sees you and all of a sudden they really are speaking on your behalf when you're not in the room right? Because they see your value, they see your passion. And I can tell you that I have one mentee that has grown into that. I see his passion, I see his, you know, desire, he will go out and create a framework on how he wants to solve a problem. And, you know, he did, he pays he to the any advice I give him, you know, he will consider it, even if he doesn't agree all the time. But then he comes and he tells me like, hey, I implemented your advice. And all of a sudden, organically, I became a sponsor. Right, I speak about him. I have him top of mind because I know what he's capable of. I think a boss that you have might become a sponsor because your boss suddenly you develop a relationship and he's grown and he's seen your potential and he's gonna start speaking on your behalf. Sponsors can come anywhere. So I think my biggest piece of advice is you cannot force it, but you can take steps to develop allies in a very positive working environment where you're showing your value and then expect that hopefully that's going to grow into a sponsorship relationship. That's great. Thank you. Um, we're going to do another myth busting question. Um, is it true that a lot of times when you get to interview at this level, you will be asked to work on some sort of case study or sample strategy as part of the interview process? Yeah. Uh, well, there are many ways to define, but I could say yes, right? Uh, you know, um, uh, many ways to define, uh, you know, this, right? It's, it's, it's going to be a written case that you need to read and bring a solution, right? That might be an approach that I have seen. And uh, there may be like, a, you know, in a room, you know, with three people and they asking you some questions, that might be another technique. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure Melissa may have a list of ways to, to, to execute this and she can share more, but I can tell you that it's a, uh, it's a very useful uh, way to see, you know, and we were talking about uh, problem solving techniques, approaches, you know, uh, how uh, individualist or team player the person is, how open is to look for help? How open is to recognize gaps? And mm -hmm. in because nobody knows everything, right? Nobody knows is is expert on everything. And sometimes it's okay to say, oh, you know what? That area is not my expertise. I need help on this one. I can, right? And uh, you you evaluate multiple aspects on on a candidate. And uh, uh, these type of techniques, right, and methodologies asking and facing a challenge or fa facing a particular situation is useful. Many companies are using that. I love it because, uh, as I said, right, it's, it's, it's a way to test so many things in the, in, in the candidate in just one, uh, one process. Do you agree with me, Melissa? Mm. Oh, we cannot hear you. No. Okay, maybe um, Stephanie, can you get us? Okay, it says it's reconnecting to the audio. Okay. Mm, I don't believe that worked. I still, we still cannot hear you. Um, Stephanie, could you give us some assistance on getting the audio back up? Um, Miriam, will you give us your perspective while we get Melissa back up and running? Um, so I think it depends on the role, right? Um, if you get asked for a case study or, you know, whether to Jose Luis's point is more of a, how would you solve this problem? Or what have you achieved? What have you done? What have been the great, and, and I don't mean it like, oh, I've redesigned something, but how? 
you know, like give us a full case study. What was the impact? What was the approach? The most challenging? What you've learned? And it might be in, you know, setting up a conversation where you're having to present this, but depending on the role, it might be that you're asked, right? To bring in proof of what you've achieved. Yeah. But it's true, Sam, and you know, while we wait for, uh, for Melissa, you know, it, it's true that it, it depends on, uh, on the role, depends on the position, multiple ways to do this. And, uh, but you know, to say it's all, all the time the same, no, it depends on, to me this point, it depends on the case, right? Okay, are we feeling like I'm back now? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yes. <laughs> I did that IT thing, unplug it and plug it back in. Um, <laughs> even though I am in HR, and so that is meant to be, you know, a soft skill, for any of my direct reports, I always send them a sample Excel spreadsheet and have them come in and tell me, what did you see in the spreadsheet? And that's all I say. I don't say any more than that because I want to see what kind of analysis do they see? What kind of data can they pull out of that? What, is, what kind of a presentation do they end up pulling together? And I leave it very ambiguous on purpose. And it's been so interesting over the years to watch how people uh, respond to that in very different ways. So um, yes, for sure, you're gonna get a case at this level. It's just gonna be, there are different ways that it'll come at you. Awesome. Yeah, so definitely make sure that as you're moving through that interview process, you're prepared with some sort of problem solving framework and then just being open to um, problem solving anything and then feedback from um, what they, the interviewers give you as well. Great, great, great stuff. Thank you. Um, so now let's switch over in terms of um, internal promotion. So one way to get high, one way to get to this level is to get hired. The other one is staying within your company and just getting to that level um, by promotions. So um, we know that in many organizations, um, there is less diversity at senior levels, right? So a lot of times it's hard for someone um, to picture themselves at that level if they don't see someone like themselves at that level. So why do you think we do see that diversity decreases as you go up in the organization? And what, um, how can we change this? Yeah, I think that's a million dollar question, but I, I think there's a um, variety of factors, right? So let's start with the simple one, which is, you know, if you look at labor statistic numbers, there's less um, candidates available who are diverse for senior leadership positions, right? That is a fact. They do exist, but you see them at a, a smaller percentage because this is a cycle. Right? It's a cycle. If, if you're not part of, you know, if you don't have those experiences and skills because you've not given the opportunity, then there's less of a, you know, pool of people to choose from. So I would say that's the most basic one. Now, secondly, there's biases. Biases exist, right? Biases exist, you know, for instance, you know, some of us here on the call have an accent, you know, and there's data that shows that to hear and to understand and pay attention to an accent, you need to use you know, more energy and effort. So right there and then Jose Luis and I are at a disadvantage, <laughs> right? So there's all these sorts of biases that truly exist uh, uh, and that are going to impact some, some uh, of our communities. So third, um, it's network and visibility. Who do you know? Right? Some of these very high executive positions are now uh, based on referrals, people referring word of mouth, hey, I know this person is super strong, this is what they've accomplished. So, you know, your access sometimes is diminished when you're a, per a person of color. You just don't know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not part of the in-group in many situations. So that might impact your opportunity to, to grow in a company. So there's just a variety of things. What do we do? I think that that's the whole case of what we're trying to to achieve, I can tell you that, um, you know, we need to be to to have organizations that are conscious and where we make decisions. Sometimes diversity is around making the decision, mm -hmm. making the yeah. decision. You know, understanding that these are biases that exist, understanding that there is a voice that you don't perhaps have heard a lot. So you need to consciously make the decision to say, I need to understand and get to know this individual, 
right? It's around fair processes. Do you have a fair process to evaluate performance? You know, can you actually, um, when you're making these decisions, look at a fair way to make the decisions, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of actions we can take uh, for um, those of us who perhaps have grown in our career. We need to become advocates and role models so that we can become more visible and people can know that, yes, it is possible and we need to lift others and we need to help others. So there's a lot of work that we can do Ultimately, you know, this is a situation only for not only for people of color, for women, right? That has taken years and it's work and it's hard, it's difficult, and it is a reality. And we all need to have a responsibility to work to address it. Awesome. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, I'm jumping in. Um, First, I would say, um, how did you pick the organization that you're a part of? Because one of my selection criteria is that there is diversity at senior levels, because that shows me more than words, more than your diversity statement on your website, that you actually value diversity. So if you see diversity at the senior levels, there's more likely to be more energy around that. And then secondarily, I would say, um, there's most organizations are going to have um, challenges in their HR and PA communities that they're trying to find diversity. So how can you help them find you? Um, many, many moons ago, I was uh, responsible for um, diversity at, um, in the technology and operations space at Bank of America. And my objective was to teach recruiters how to find diverse candidates for the roles they had open. So if they're looking for you, can, can they find you? Are, are you saying that you're a member of ASE? Are, are you giving them that hint that helps them to see that you can add to the diversity at their organization? So just a couple of thoughts. If I compliment is that um you know i think um everything said is um you know it's it's real you know there are some biases but it's also important the role that, that each of us played on this right because this is a it's a it's a collective effort to get to a better place as a society and right um, but i will say start with each of us individually you know each of us need to believe that you know, we have value, we can contribute, we can bring impact uh, to organizations, we can change, we can transform. And that is, um, there is no day when I came to US that I lost my faith and I didn't believe that I was going to be able to be a senior vice president, vice president of an organization like Nielsen. Never, I never thought, oh, oh it's not gonna happen to me because I am a mm -hmm. Latino person. No way, you know, sometimes it's tough, right? Because, we, you know, you may face some challenges in the road, but uh, believe that it's possible. And uh, here you have an example, right? And, uh, and you probably here in this, uh, in this uh, call, we may have other good examples of that is, that is possible. And there will be more. Companies are realizing now, and this is not only here, everywhere, right? That uh, diversity is a must. It's a must because we are working with a diverse society. Our clients are diverse. We have a multiple type of, of clients. If we are not diverse, we will not understand. We will not grow as companies. And that's a, that is a key, that very important reality that is happening now. So, but I um, believe it's possible. I love it. All right, so speaking and staying in the terms of um, diversity, how can we as diverse um, associates or diverse people, how can we use diversity to add value and move up in the organization, such as like managing global teams or knowing different cultures and languages? Like, is that an advantage that you, that you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you that yes, yes, but it depends on what organization you work for. And I'm mm -hmm. gonna be very yeah. honest and tell you Nielsen is a great place to work for that reason, right? <laughs> Uh, um, you know, in, in my company at Nielsen, in our company, you know, we really value 
and we understand that we need to measure consumers who are diverse. I'm gonna tell you that my first opportunity to get an expanded role was when we were trying to, you know, to work with some, um, some neighborhoods where we only got Spanish speaking people and some of our materials were not getting us to convert those into Nielsen, uh, Nielsen um, homes when we used to do the TV diary and, you know, we would send um, a diary to people and people would tell us what they want on TV. And I basically brought my diversity to the table to try to help Nielsen solve the issue and work with other experts on, you know, okay, so I'm Hispanic. I know that if I read this, I wouldn't understand it. Why don't we do it this other way? And hey, by the way, why are we training some of our people who are calling to place, um, you know, to, to get people to, to do this diary? Why do we train them? with all English materials? What if we use some Spanish language? So I use my diversity to get my first projects. But why? Because Nielsen cared and Nielsen understood. And mm -hmm. that's, I, I would say that then, you know, when I became a black belt, I raised my hand to oversee some programs in LATAM because I spoke Spanish, right? So I could do North American LATAM. And, and my diversity in a global company was very helpful. And then I worked in Europe and I was able to work very closely with Spain, right? Because I spoke Spanish. So I think that you, if you're in the right organization, you're going to be able to use your diversity to your advantage because you have something else that other people don't have. And you're going to be able to, to explore it. And then as you, you know, you grow in your, in your, in your, um, as you grow in your careers, it's going to follow you. I can tell you as a DNI. Um, professional for a global company, I get on calls where I'm engaging and I'm speaking with LATAM on DNA strategies in language. That's an advantage that not a lot of people have, right? And, um, but you have to be in the right company. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and one thing that um, came in that I think we can probably address right away too is, you know, a lot of times we do have uh, Latinos that don't speak Spanish. So I think it, there, there's more it's not only the language that you can provide, but it's also the understanding of different cultures. And that can also bring a lot of value too. And perspective, right? I mean, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, your perspective is gonna be very different than a different household, right? Yep. You're, you're bringing a different perspective to the table and you can use it to raise your voice and it's gonna be valuable in a company that appreciates it and values it. So that's why, you know, also sometimes you gotta, you got to break up with your company if it's not the right one and come to work for right. Nielsen. <laughs> awesome. Is there um, any other thoughts you guys would like to add to this question before we jump in? We've gotten a lot of great questions, so I am yeah. excited to jump into those. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Let, let's wait and let's go to the questions. I think these are the important ones. All right. I will jump to a quick yes or no uh, question to start. How long should your resume be at this level? Is it one or two pages? How, how hard should you try to keep it succinct? So there's not a magic length. Um, I've been working for a lot of years, um, and my resume is three pages long. But it is, it is crisp. It is, this is my role. It, this is what that company did. And here are five things that I did to add value in that organization. And then when I get further back, it may just say my role and my title, and then I would get further, further back, it may just say I worked for these companies and these were my roles. So you just have to think about how can you, uh, it's not about the link, it's about the value add that is in the resume. Fantastic, thank you. Um, this is a great question. In order to get the attention of higher ups, you need to be a lead on major projects to be able to show your work to them. How can we get our current managers to give us these high visibility roles instead of giving, giving them to others on the team that they are closer to? For example, other employees on the team that are more like them or that are white. So, I mean, I okay, can so oh, 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 go ahead, Melissa. Go ahead, I'll follow you. So I think I can offer some perspective in two ways. One is, again, let's go back to the company, right? Are you in the right company? I'm going to be honest. But secondly, I think you also have to come up with ideas and problems you want to solve. Set up a meeting and say, hey, I have, this is the problem I want to solve. I want, I want to help in this way and I want to contribute. 
Can I be part mm -hmm. of this? I want to be part of the team. Mm -hmm. And if you're constantly getting the no, 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 even though you're willing to put the time, the effort, and you have the framework on how you plan to solve, then maybe it is time, right? To look for an, a mm -hmm. different opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly where I was going, Miriam, is volunteer. If you know that there are projects that are out there, go in and say, I know this project is coming up. Here's what I'm thinking about it. Here's why I think I could lead it. And if you're not given that opportunity, you, you may want to move to another department or you know, consider your next play. Yeah, let me, let me say that um, it, have, be open to get feedback, right? Because it's easy to jump into conclusions like, you know, oh, it's because of I'm, let's say, Latino. Don't, you know, and don't get me wrong, right? But it's, I'm not saying that it's easy, but. It can be, you know, the reason why uh, I'm saying that, and, um, oh, you know, it's because of this, when in fact, what is happening is, um, is that you have maybe not the set of skills that are needed for that role, or you still need to invest probably a couple of, uh, you know, uh, tasks and uh, or activities to really develop, you know, experience, right? Or to learn a technique on, on this one. Be open to feedback, look for feedback, ask the question and have an honest conversation with your boss there, right? And if you go, you propose, I said, no, I think about that person. Okay, fine. Okay, what is the plan? I want to close that gap. Mm -hmm. Let let, let me prepare and work on that to make sure that uh, the next time we have an opportunity like this, I am the number, the first option on, on that table, right? That's, um, that for me, it's important. Don't, don't jump into that conclusion immediately. Get feedback, be proactive, act on that, closing any gap for going for pursuing the career that you want. You manage it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in, in staying in terms of um, uh, experience and, and kind of having certifications, uh, we did get an excellent question that I think a lot of people who might be starting some of that job uh, search process again. Um, so we have uh, an attendee who has completed or they actually were at the director MVP level for a company that they worked on, uh, worked at for 15 years. Uh, their position was eliminated, but they never uh, completed a bachelor's education, which is something that a lot of companies require. Um, what, what do you recommend uh, about getting back on track and into other director roles? Okay, jumping in. Um, first, I would say quite often when director level roles are posted, they say, bachelor's degree or equivalent experience. And if you've already worked for 15 years, you have the equivalent experience. Um, and once you get over that first hurdle of getting into the interview process, you have to communicate why your experience is as good or better than some, someone that got a degree because a degree should not be an absolute requ requirement. Experience counts. Yeah, and I would say it on, on let's say it on the, from the recruitment point of view, right? I has been interviewing and, and asking and checking. It's not that you look for, you know, if you remember the first question that we had, and you know, hey, what is the things that you look into a resume, right? And this is me, and I know that many managers, directors are looking and VPs are not looking at, oh, let me see if that person has title A. You don't mm -hmm. see that, I, I mean, it, not at this level, right? Oh no, that person has 15 years career delivering results, consistent results, three companies over delivering on, you know, if it's about sales or it's about operation, efficiencies, transformation, digitization, whatever you name it, right? You said, think about this as an interviewer and, and, and recruiter, I'm looking for, I, have, I might have a challenge, I might have a position and I want that role, that team to achieve a, a goal and I need to bring that expertise to my company. That's what I'm looking for at the, at the very end. It's very simple, oversimplifying the process, right? Yes, you can believe that a title can be probably, oh yeah, the title can help me to secure some skills, but it's not the only way to secure those skills, right? There are many other ways and experience is one. Results, real results, 
authenticity on those results is going to be critical in the process. A hundred percent. Yeah, I would say that if you're seeking certificates or certifications, don't do it because, you know, a job will require it necessarily at the director level. More unless, of course, you're a very highly specialized, you know, like you need to be a CPA. That's different. But I would say that do it because there is a skill that you want to develop and you want to improve. I do things all the time. Like I just did a design thing, but it's a passion because I love solving problems. I like to collaborate and it enhances my value and the results I deliver. But nobody can say, oh, does Miriam have a design thinking certificate? Nah, I don't even think I have it on my um, LinkedIn. Yeah. Go, going back to something that you mentioned, um, Jose Luis, and it ties closely to this next question, uh, in reflecting your experience, so for uh, what are some specific skills that you should make sure that you do list for director level and above? So anything along the lines of like budgeting experience or managing people, et cetera. Well, there is one, uh, I, I believe at this level, if you are not a team player, uh, you are out of the game, right? It's, you know, being uh, selfish and uh, individualist and no, I'm not thinking even, even more in this, these times where technology has made, made us fully interconnected, whatever you are gonna do, have, you need to think about the implications and also how to leverage other, other teams, right? Team player, being a team player is one that I read. When I read the impact and when I talk to people, I try to see how a real team player that person is. For me, this is a success factor for the future, any and in this role. The other thing is obviously, right, it's about, uh, it sounds basic, but it's not that basic. It's that the leadership skills that you need to have, right? When I think I mentioned about vision, but also, you know, how you, how authentic and honest you are managing people, right? Because that is, you know, today, in my view, leadership is, is a lot about influencing people to move in one direction, to get to that vision. You know, it's not anymore about ordering Right, and, you know, but, you know, things like empowerment are very important. But you empower and you move people in the right direction. If people are feeling that they go, you know, and they they need to execute a strategy, and that's what the language that you use at that level, right? And um, you know, the leadership skill, influencing, you know, um, capabilities and uh, engaging with people, managing, and uh, and sometimes these are soft. You need to think about and listen about experience and experience it from, from the person. But uh, for me, a team player, leadership skills, influencing leadership, those are things that are, you know, extremely relevant for, for roles like senior uh, vice presidents, et cetera. Great, and I am mindful that we only have two minutes left. So um, Stephanie, maybe we can find a way to capture some of the outstanding questions and follow up with them because they, they're really, really good questions that um, I think we can all benefit from. But I wanted to save the last two minutes to just give our leaders an opportunity to share any last words of wisdom or advice as people are looking to either find a job or get to this level in their careers. My last thought would be, don't think of your career as a ladder. Think of it as a jungle gym. Because if you move around the jungle gym, you can learn different skills. And that will move you up more than waiting until you have these 17 things to move to this level. So just really think about, it doesn't always have to be straight up. It can be around and over before you get through. I love that team, I love the team in Melissa, I like it. And in that, I will say, own it. On your path in that jungle, you said, right? It's, uh, yeah. yeah, take ownership on that, drive it yourself. Nobody else is gonna do better than you, right? And think about in that journey, the impact that you are leaving behind, the legacy, but also what you, what else you want to build in the future. It is all on you. Yeah. And, uh, and think uh, and, and take that ownership and, uh, and that's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I, I mean, I concur. That was amazing. Manage it, own it, treat it as you treat your work, right? Identify your key stakeholders, the people you need to influence, create a plan yeah. and be relentless. Be relentless because it might take a little longer. It depends, right? But be relentless, find the right people to influence. Don't just focus on your work 
open your eyes to finding the mentors, open your eyes to um, networking, to finding new people that can expand your thinking, continue to learn and grow and be relentless. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, we are at time. So um, Stefan, I'll turn it over to you to do anything else that you need to do to wrap up and, and bring us back. Awesome. That was great. Thank you all so much for a great discussion. Um, I know we have a lot of really engaged people and we will definitely uh, follow up with all of you. Um, you will also be re receiving the recording of this webinar in case you know of any of your peers that would benefit from this session. But uh, I just wanted to share, um, say thank you to our panelists and, for Sam and to Samantha for helping us coordinate this um, amazing webinar. Be on the lookout for more events coming up. And again, um, stay tuned for our National Leadership Summit where you will also have an opportunity to connect with Nelson. Um, thank you all so much. And at this point, I'll, I'll go ahead and end it, but um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you.